My name is Lou Zobie. Uh, I served with the 17th Airborne Division and I served in uh, Europe, the Battle of the Bulge to Berlin. I had already wanted to go in and volunteer, but my parents wouldn't let me. Uh, back in the day, we uh, obeyed our parents. And uh, although some of the guys, you know, lied about their age and went in. But my parents said, wait, you're going to get drafted, so wait until they call you. So I, I waited. Back then, there was a big patriotism. Guys wanted to go. The attitude was, I wanted to go, see? What, what year was that, and how old were you? In 18, 1943. Yeah. And in August, things had uh, quieted down because uh, all the German army had been pushed back into Germany. And Eisenhower and Montgomery, in the months of August, September, October, were waiting for Hitler to surrender. It's winding down. We're, we're hoping that we don't have to go because nobody really wants to go into war. His army had been devastated, so he was recruiting unbeknownst to anybody, from 15 years old to about 60 years old to fill up this army. And he assembled, he assembled about 450,000. And so in the meantime, nobody knew anything. We, we, we thought we, war was over for us. However, December 16th, 1944, Hitler penetrates the few divisions that were still scattered along the German border. Christmas Eve were flown into France. Christmas Day was a sea ration dinner. And if anybody knows what sea rations are, it's a little can, like hash, cold hash on Christmas Day. The next day, we're trucked up to the front. Big slatted trucks, they were like cattle trucks maybe 50, 60 guys standing with their rifles and packs. At that time, that was the coldest winter that they'd had in many years. Temperatures around 10 degrees. So you take everything off to try to dig in. I hung my coat on a cedar branch and tried to dig in with a little army shovel. Well, you couldn't. Uh, you, after about an hour and a half, you're down about two inches into the ground. And so, but at that point, about two, three hours later, they said, pack up, we're moving forward. Well, when I packed everything and reached for my overcoat, it was frozen solid. And I carried it like a body on my shoulder. And uh, snow was about ankle deep at that point. And we trudged forward. And uh, about the second, the third day, I, I passed a G young German soldier, a frozen, you know, laying there in the ground. And I happened to look at him as I walked by, and I said, "Holy crap! This is, uh, you know, this is this fellow's about the same age as me." The only thought I had was, "This could be me tomorrow." You know, this, you're scared. Everybody is scared because you're walking into the unknown and uh, you had to do your thing. The people started, soldiers started to complain about frozen feet. And the doctors, uh, first guys that complained about day three was they got evacuated. About day four, when the rest of us started to complain, uh, they wouldn't let us go because they needed us to finish this war. Now, uh, so from then on, unless you showed evidence of gangrene, you're not to be evacuated. I said that there was about 450,000 German soldiers spread all over this area, and we threw in about a half a million. Now, that's a big battle. We were totally exposed because we had to cross an open field, uh, like a ridge line, and then go down into town and all kinds of machine gun bullets are spraying all over the place. Uh, we talk about being scared. I mean, you're running and you're, you, you don't know what's coming at you. You hear it, but you, you can't see it. As I ran to the hedge line, and a body passed me. Uh, all I could see was this body passing me, and I, 
I couldn't figure out who the heck that was. So when we got to the hedgerow and hunkered down, who was it? But it was my, ca my company commander. And he was about 45 years old and pudgy guy. And he was more scared than I was. <laughs> he, and he read, uh, it took us three days and we recaptured that town. And as a result of that, we all got the Bronze Star. And there was a German uh, Sherman tank going up and down Main Street, spraying all over with their 50 caliber machine gun. And I had two friends who were bazooka, they were the bazooka team. One carried the bazooka, the other one carried the mortar shells. And so Hawley and Bill got down there and, and waited by the side of a building until that tank went by and, you know, shot it out and uh, knocked it out. Of course, the guys had to get out, the German soldiers had to get out. When they got out, of course, they were wiped out. A uh, thousand casualties a day. Uh, that's uh, that's sad. I'm, I'm one of the extremely lucky guys of World War II. Things happened probably eight or nine or ten times where I should have been killed, but I wasn't. And you wonder why. The fellow next to me gets shot, not me. So on a cold sunny day one day, it was quiet. It was early morning when my platoon leader said, uh, we've lost communication. So you pick up the wire and trace it back to where the break is. And there it is out in the open field where a border shell had broken it. And I find both pieces, a cold day, sunny, and mortar shells are very distinctive. They whistle. And as they get closer, you know, it's <laughs> and I hear it go behind me, boom. And you see the snow blow up. And I, I figure, well, okay, it's a harassment, see? And so another one goes to the right, and I get the first two wires done. When the third one goes to my left, then it dawned on me, I'm a little black spot on the white snow. They're only 1,500 feet ahead. And I, I said, the next one is going to be me. So I dropped everything and dove into the first foxhole. Anyway, that's the way it was. You went back and I spliced the wires and got connections. And they were retreating because we outnumbered them, we outgunned them. The reason Hitler did this, he did this battle uh, against his general's advice. The generals told him to surrender. But he was a maniac, paranoid guy. He, his idea was if he could get across Belgium to Ant Antwerp on the coast, that's where all the oil, fuel for planes, tanks, and that's what he needed to keep his army going. Of course, he never made it. Now, the Battle of Bulge ended on January 25th. It was 40 days. It's the biggest battle of World War II in terms of the number of men and soldiers involved and the total number between Germany and us, almost a million. There were 81,000 casualties, 19,000 deaths, 23,000 prisoners of war. Even though we were pushing them back, they were still taking prisoners whenever they could. Of course, the saddest part of the and I always thought was, uh, you know, the Battle of the Bow started on December 16th. On December 17th, there is what's called the Malmedy Massacre. That was on the 17th when they first broke through in this little town in Belgium. They captured 84 American soldiers, marched them behind a barn, and executed them. That's the saddest thing. And, and of course, they were, some of those officers, uh, German officers, ended up at Nuremberg and uh, got charged for all of that. One day in the stand, again, it was bright, sunny, cold day, quiet. So five guys are standing in there, just ch uh, small talk. When all of a sudden mortar shells come in on the top, hits the trees, shrapnel comes down. 
and in a matter of 10 seconds, one fellow was killed. The other fellow lost an arm. Two other guys got heavy shrapnel, and I'm standing there with a half-inch cut on my hand. You say, why me? You know, I have to tell you that going through war, you have to believe that there's somebody watching you. The big guy in the sky, see? I don't tell horror stories because I didn't have horror stories. I never saw a German soldier face to face. They were always in the distance in the woods. And if you fired, you're firing back because they're firing at you. You didn't, you didn't see who you were firing at. Uh, so in my case, one of the scary things one morning, they said, we're going to do a, an attack, uh, fix bayonets. <laughs> now, of course, in basic training, you're taught how to use a bayonet. How, of course, it's never in war conditions. Now you're real. This is real now. Fix bayonets. And I'm, I'll never forget the thought that I went through my head was, what am I going to do if I f find this person? You know, fortunately, the, they had retreated, and we didn't have to use it. See, you never had to come that close. Yeah. January twenty fifth. That was the end. And they said uh, the Battle of Bulge is over. The German army's back into Germany. What's left of them? And uh, that part is done. Well, it means that uh, we must serve our country. We must protect our country when called upon. Not everybody has to volunteer to be in the service. I don't say that. But I am afraid that if there was a call to arms, whether we would get as many and as fast as we did in World War II. See? Now, World War II, incidentally, is... Uh, the biggest war since the beginning of civilization. People don't understand that there are like over 30 countries involved. People don't understand that there were over 50 million people, oh, estimated, over 50 million people died around the world in all these for, during World War II. We don't want anything like that anymore. However, comes a point when you're attacked you have to defend yourself. And I like to feel that we would build up enough patriotism in our minds and in the schools and so forth that say that come a time when we have to do something like this again, that they'll be ready for the action.